we should look a little bit at Moodle so you have that Mathematica homework due yesterday. Uh, there will be one more long Mathematica assignment like that. That's going to be due next Tuesday. Again, on an off day here. Again, your working groups. Once again, I've got a link on Moodle to download it right there. And once again, there will be five problems to do and a link to upload it when you're done. Okay, don't forget to follow the directions, rename the file, and, and put everybody's name inside. I also want to alert you to the fact um, that the graded assignment for Friday, right here, is three problems. Okay, why three problems? Well, they're all kind of related to each other. Right, they're, they're kind of tied together. So far, your gradients have been worth 10 points. I think even though that's three problems, I'm not going to make it worth 30 points. I think I'll make it worth 20, though, to acknowledge the fact that it is more problems. But they're all tied together uh, related to Euler's method. Um, it's essentially applying Euler's method to the same problem in a, with a couple different delta t's, and then sort of trying to observe what happens. Why do you get the different things happening? And that's another thing that you should have observed with today's completion assignment is that Euler's method can go wrong um, in certain situations. So you do need to be cautious about using Euler's method. In general, you might say the smaller delta t is, the, the better those problems can be fixed. But even really small delta t's can still sometimes lead to trouble. All right. Um, one more comment. The completion assignment that's going to be due on Friday is going to be something where I'm not really going to have a ton of time to talk about the particular mode of thinking, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the particular mode of thinking that needs to go into those problems in class today. I will address it a little bit, but I've got some other things I want to address that's still related to that section, but you're not going to find explicitly in the book in the way I'm going to talk about it. So it's some extra things that I'm going to talk about. And it's going to be the start of continuing to talk about pretty consistently, maybe five to ten minutes per class period, kind of an abstract, difficult subject that I'm going to actually give you some supplements for. Now, there are no exercises in these supplements you'll be happy to know. So far, I've written two of them. This is the first one. It's an extra supplement with some extra reading and some extra examples to make it explicit what I'm going to be spending, again, a little bit of time each class period on for a bit. Again, it will be difficult, and I, but I am going to want you to study it and try to learn the material for the first exam to some degree. We'll have to decide what is a reasonable amount of learning to do uh, on this abstract subject for the first exam. Why am I doing this abstract subject? Because it's going to pay benefits down the line, especially in chapter 3 and 4 and 5, in fact, as well. We'll get some real good benefits out of dealing with the abstract and confusing subject early later on. That's when the benefits come. Okay? So again, no exercises with these supplements that I'll put online. I'll tell you to read them, work through them as best you can. I will talk about them to some extent in class, a little bit each day. And I think eventually we'll get to the point where we're comfortable with it, at least to some degree. Say with simple examples. Okay? All right, but first today, I think it would be good to um, think about a Newton's law of cooling slash heating problem. So you had a graded problem related to that, I guess, was due Monday. Right, that was the day it was due? Yeah. Cooling slash heating, meaning you can apply the model either to situations where things are cooling down or heating up. The same model essentially applies. Here's a situation I made up. And I love using capital T and lowercase t so that my function is t of t, just for fun. Capital T is the temperature. All right, let's use degrees Celsius. Of a well-mixed coffee, well coffee in a mug, and little t is time in minutes since you took the coffee off the heat source. If the room temperature is 21 degrees Celsius and the coffee starts out at a very hot temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. I forgot my C there. Yeah. 
And if you know, you have a thermometer handy and it's cooled to 58 degrees after one minute, how long will it take to cool to a more palatable 43 degrees Celsius? And we're going to consider a more complicated situation as well. All right. Let's do this by hand to review separation of variables and also to review some other ideas I've been talking about. Isn't this great? dt dt, d capital T, d lowercase t, the rate of change of the temperature with respect to time. Newton's law of cooling says, and slash heating says, that that's proportional to the difference between the current temperature, the value of capital T at a certain moment of time, and the room temperature. Proportional to the difference, capital T minus the room temperature. Let's call it R here initially. That's the ambient room temperature. In our case, R is 21 degrees Celsius. All right, there's my proportionality symbol. What does that mean as far as an equation goes? Some constant multiplier of that? Yeah, there's some constant, constant of proportionality that makes this quantity equal to the constant times this quantity. And does this make intuitive sense? The bigger the temperature difference is, whether positive or negative, the bigger the derivative should be in absolute value. If something's really hot and room temperature is fairly cool, it's going to cool down pretty fast initially, at least, until it approaches room temperature. If it's warming up, if room temperature is up here, and you've got an ice cube, or well, no, don't, don't consider an ice cube, because you've got to consider you know, the energy that goes into melting it. Uh, cold water in a hot room, okay, it's going to warm up initially pretty quickly. But when it gets close to room temperature, it doesn't warm up as fast. This rate of change is proportional to this difference. There's some constant pro proportionality. Call it K, that I can multiply T minus R by to get an equality here. Now, if I write it as T minus R here, will that constant of proportionality be positive or negative? Think about it. Think about cooling coffee. Negative. It's going to be a negative constant of proportionality. Now, I could just call it a K. and say k is negative. Or I could emphasize the negativity of the constant by putting a negative sign in front of it and saying k is positive. So that negative k is negative. You can do it either way, as long as you keep track. You also could write it here. So here k is positive, so negative k it's negative, and it's really negative k that's the constant proportionality in that case. You also could write it with r minus t instead of t minus r, and have a constant there, and in that case the constant of proportionality really would be positive. And if your coffee's hotter than the room temperature, this difference would be negative, still making your derivative negative so the coffee's cooling down. Any way of doing it is okay. It'll all work out the same in the end when you solve the initial value problem. I think I like doing it this way best. Let's go ahead and solve this differential equation, keeping the k and the r in there instead of picking specific numbers, though, to solve the problem, we need to pick specific values for k and r. r is easy, r is 21. k is a little trickier. You need to use the fact that it cools to 58 after one minute. The initial value of 60 is going to affect the value of the arbitrary, <coughs> arbitrary constant. So when we separate variables here, this is probably the best way to do it. Little t and capital T are the variables. R and K are constants. 
I've got all my capital T's on the left and all my little t's just in the DT there on the right. Now you start shaking, must integrate to, there we go. This becomes negative KT plus, okay, I'll call it C1. By the way, with all this C1, C2, C3 stuff, I actually, on the exam, say, don't care if you just always call them C and just in your mind keep track of this, in your mind that the C's are not the same C. We're after the right answer at the end, one way of writing the general solution with an arbitrary constant C. So if you're sloppy in that particular kind of thing, it's not such a big deal to me. Though it can be tricky, you might make a mistake if you're too sloppy. Here you get uh, natural log of the absolute value of t minus r. That's what that equals. We can exponentiate, and it turns out to be okay, as you might hope, to get rid of the absolute value signs. We're not getting into details about why. It does turn out to be okay. It does give you a general solution in the end. You end up with t minus r equaling well, I'll call it C2e to the negative kt. Oh, no, I'll call this one C. We'll be able, be able to stop there. T itself, as a function of time, is r plus C e to the negative kt. Again, if we abuse notation and write that, that's okay, and that's what the book technically does, in a sense. But, again, I'm often going to call it phi of t. And I think if I, put an, if I put an arbitrary but fixed initial condition on this, t of 0 equals t sub 0, and solve for c based on that, ultimately when I write my final answer, I'm going to put a phi in there. C is going to be T0 minus R in this case. It's not equal to the initial temperature here. The arbitrary constant is not necessarily always equal to the initial value. It often has been, but not necessarily. And this is a case where it's not. So now I can combine these things. Okay, now I'll go ahead and use my capital V. And I'll go ahead and use a subscript to emphasize what the arbitrary initial value is. V sub T0, subscripts within subscripts there. That's just specifying that that's going to be the initial value of T. That's all that subscript is doing. Of T, replace that C with T0 minus R. So you get R plus in parentheses t0 minus r e to the negative kt. That could be written in another way. You could group the r terms together and factor out the r. But it's probably best to leave it like that. By the way, this does show analytically if you let t go to infinity, little t, since k is positive, making negative k negative, this exponential term is going to go to zero as little t goes to infinity, making this whole term go to zero, meaning the long-term temperature is room temperature, R. Can I clarify anything with this? Get that? Let's check it with d solve value. Capital T prime of T equals equals negative K times capital T of T. Again, I need to put the little t in the right-hand side with Mathematica. No little t's there. This is autonomous. Capital T of 0 equals T 0. Solve for just capital T as a pure function, or I, or simply probably for just using the solve value in a, a simple way, put a capital T of little t, and put the little t last. 
Mathematica seems to put these things in unexpanded form. I don't know why, but you can expand this. There we go, that's better. Do we have a match? Yes, we do. <coughs> factor in e to the negative kt on these two terms, and you have a t0 minus r next to it. All right, um, now we want to solve the problem, though. So we need to use the numbers. So the fact that um, room temperature is 21 means r is 21. The initial value, t0, is 60, so we're all in degrees Celsius. How do you find K? You need to find K based on this extra value that you've measured with your thermometer that's cooled to 58 degrees Celsius after one minute. V of 1 equals 58. That's going to help us find K. Go to the formula down there, plug in R equals 21, capital or T0 equals 60. 60 minus 21 is going to be 39. So we're going to have 21 plus 39 e to the negative k times 1 must equal 58. Right. Look back and forth, check that over. We want to solve that for k. We're going to get e to the negative k is 58 minus 21 over 39. So that's going to be 37 over 39. Right. Um, no. Yep, that's right. Let's make sure I don't make a mistake. Negative k is going to be the natural log of that. So k itself is going to be the negative of the natural log of 37 over 39 which is the same as the natural log of 39 over 37, by the way. You should know that. Bring that negative sign up with the exponent of 37, 39 is a negative one exponent, which means take the reciprocal, write it around like that. I'll remind you that in Mathematica, natural log is actually capital L-O-G. We could use the capital N function to get an approximation to this. We can actually just put a decimal point as well, and I'll, I'll give a numerical approximation. About 0 0.0526437. Technically speaking, I probably am using too many significant digits if I'm writing those all down. However, you know, since errors can pile up if you round too soon, in a sense, it's probably best to go ahead and keep these along the way before you, final, you answer your final question. You only round them. That's probably the best technique to use. If you're, if you're trying to report the value of k, that's too many significant digits. But keep those values for the purposes of hopefully getting a better approximation to the last question. And now are we ready to do that? We have everything we need? Yeah, now um, set capital T equal to 43 and solve for little t. We'll have to use the logarithm again. So what do we have here? We've got 21 plus 39 e to the negative 0 0.0526437t, we want that to be 43. And that's going to be the last answer to the last question. So e to the negative 0 0.0526437t will be 43 minus 21 over 39. 22 over 39, take the log of both sides, divide both sides by negative 0 0.0526437. T is going to be negative 1 over 0 0.0526437 times the natural log of 22 over 39. 
I won't bother making that an exponent. Not, help, not really helpful. Just leave it like this. Got a guess? This will be a positive number, by the way, even with the negative sign there, because natural log of this number that's less than 1 is going to be negative. Log of 22 over 39 divided by 0 0.05, uh, negative, negative 0 0.05, 2, 4, 3, 2, 6, 4, 3, 7. 2, 6, 4, 3, 7. Got a guess? I think it's around 10 minutes. Oh, I knew I had it. Okay. Closer to 11 minutes. Okay. From time zero, not from the time that you measured at time one to be 58. That's the time after time zero. About 11 minutes is probably, you know, two significant digits is probably best. One, three, 10.9. That would be like 10 minutes and 54 seconds or so. Probably best to round it to 11 minutes. Okay. What if, for some crazy reason, the room temperature was not constant? Yikes. But oscillated according to this function, whose period I may be, let's see, 2 pi over pi over 5. The pi's would cancel. The 2 and the 5 would actually end up being multiplied. The period is 10 minutes. The room is oscillating between, from a high of 24 and a low of 18 degrees Celsius, with a period that is 10 minutes. Wow. That probably would be difficult to get your heater and air conditioner to work in such a way and still keep the airflow mixed, but we're going to have fun pretending we can anyway here. Can D solve value do it? And, and how would you mod modify the differential equation? Take a guess. By the way, does Newton's law of cooling and heating work perfectly? I don't know. I'm guessing it sounds reasonable. I've never heard somebody say it works perfectly. We're think talking about reasonableness here. Um, would it be affected by what the air, the liquid? Yeah, is? yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, there's insulation factors to keep track of. There's mixing factors. Is the coffee a uniform temperature? So yes, we're oversimplifying things because of that. I suppose you would, you would guess perhaps that the, um, the nature of the mug, how insulated it is, affects what K is. It affected how fast it cooled from 60 to 58 in one minute. And so that probably is taking care of the nature of the insulation. But there is the mixing issue, and there is, can you really do that with room temperature and keep the air well mixed as well? You have a guess about how we should modify the differential equation? Here's a hint. What should I do with that R? What would seem reasonable? I five over five times t. Yes, I should let you finish. Sorry. This seems reasonable, at least. The instantaneous rate of change of the temperature, capital T, with respect to little t in a sense is still proportional to the difference between the temperature of the coffee and the room temperature. It's a proportionality that occurs at any instant in time. Not only is the coffee cooling, but the room temperature is changing constantly. Can D solve value do it? I don't know. I guess so. Wow, look at that. I don't want to do that one by hand. Actually, it, it, I, theoretically, I could do it by hand using some techniques in section 1.8, but it would be a big pain, you can tell. Well, 
Okay. Uh, what should we do here? How about using a P symbol? Call this phi. Uh, how about two subscripts? Sub T zero and comma K as a function of T. Copy and paste all this stuff, the magic of copy and paste. Save typing, enter it. Okay, um, let's still pretend the initial temperature is 60 and pretend it still <laughs> cools to 58 after one minute. Though I guess if the room temperature is oscillating, it's going to cool to 58 in a slightly different way than it did before, but we're still going to say that occurs after one minute. Is it possible that solve could possibly solve the following equation for K? I don't know. Looking over the equation, I see K's both in numerators and denominators. I don't know if it can work or not. Let's try it. Cannot be solved. Oh. So do I give up? No, don't give up. <laughs> uh, N solve can solve equations numerically. However, I think it's still based on a symbolic approach. A better thing to do is a purely numerical thing, which is called fine root, which I believe, probably, I'm guessing here, uses something called Newton's method to solve the equation, which does not require symbolic manipulations. It only impro um, involves iteration, like Euler's method, actually. Though you need to, need to give it a guess here, maybe I should guess about 0 0.05 like before. Hey, it gave me some answer. 0 0.05395.03. Correct guess. Yeah, it wasn't too far off from our other K. It sort of makes sense. I mean, the, the average temperature here of the room is still 21. And it's still cooling down to 58. In one minute, and this temperature is not going to change a ton over one minute. Makes some intuitive sense that it should be close. Um, so now let me go ahead and plug in that value of k to show the formula for this thing as a function of t. So I'll replace k with 0 0.0539503, replace 1 with t. There's our function that would model this situation, our solution for the initial value problem with initial temperature 60, temperature one, after one minute being 50, 58, and room temperature oscillating according to the equation we had before. So we could try probably fine root again to figure out when our coffee is going to cool to 43 once again, but now plug in the K solve for T this time. Should I guess about 10 for T? Sounds reasonable. Yeah, not too far off. It cools to 43 a little faster in this situation. If the model's accurate. Again, you would have to confirm with experiment whether the model, model is accurate or not. You have to somehow set up an experiment with this. We can plot this function as well. doesn't look very oscillatory in and of itself. However, if you go past time 10 to like say time 200, not 2000, look at that, it becomes sort of oscillatory. Cool. Hey, maybe I should plot the room temperature on top of the same graph here. Uh, save a tiny bit of typing there. 
Look at that. The room temperature oscillates between 18 and 24 every 10 minutes. There's 10 minutes right there. We're back to where it started at 21. Um, in a sinusoidal way like this. And the average temperature is 21 still. And the rate, of the uh, temperature of the coffee goes down, heads toward 21 in an oscillatory way. It's not having a horizontal asymptote of 21, but ultimately sort of like the ultimate average value of the, the coffee temperature is 21. It's still oscillating because the room temperature is changing. I think that's pretty cool. Do notice when you get down here that the slope of the temperature of the coffee is positive when it's when the blue graph is below the orangish graph here. And it's a negative slope when the blue graph is above the orangish graph. Related to how the differential equation is. The derivative is positive or negative depending on that difference being positive or negative. So I think that's pretty cool. Let's try to use Euler's method for this now. I think it's also cool that the amplitude of the temperature changes in the coffee is ultimately smaller than the room temperature change in amplitude, which makes sense. There's this lag factor. Um, let's try this with Euler's method now. What do I need to do with Euler's method? I need to take my right-hand side function here and call that f. Right? This is not autonomous now. This is going to be f of little t comma capital T. Plug in the value of k we found. Um, we do want to get rid of the little t by the capital T because we're focused on the form of the right hand side function. F of little t on the capital T. But because of little t over here, it is not autonomous equation. This is the right hand side function for a non autonomous equation. What was Euler's method again? It's a pair of recursive equations. I used little t and y last time, that's the generic way to do it. but to stay consistent with this application, I'll use little t and capital T. There's the basic form. Find the new value of both little t and capital T by taking the old values of little t and capital T at step k and adding on the corresponding changes in little t and capital T. You pick this one. You pick. And you have to calculate this one. You calculate. And actually, technically speaking, I should probably have a subscript on this one. Delta T sub K. Because that quantity doesn't stay constant. This quantity stays constant. Delta T sub K, in fact, as we talked about on Monday, is found by taking the slope of the line segment in the slope field at the given point and multiplying it times delta T. And that should make good sense. Find the, the total change in capital T, whether positive or negative. Take the slope, positive or negative, times the change in time. Slope at the preceding point T sub, little t sub k comma capital T sub k times delta t. For sake of time, again, I'm going to use it in a kind of confusing but efficient way using nest list in Mathematica. Again, I'm not going to have time to explain it today. I hope maybe on Friday I can explain it, explain what nest list does. You could look it up a little bit on your own, what nest list does. I'll sort of explain it, but it's probably not going to be satisfying to you. I'm defining a function, capital G, I've called it. You did see this in your key, and so I hope you have a chance to look over 
think about how it worked maybe in that key for the completion problems. I'm going to take its input to be in a list of two elements, little t and capital T, thinking of it as a point. And its output is going to be two-dimensional as well. Oh, and I guess I use the subscript as well to specify what the delta T was. I'm using it as a subscript because I don't want to, I don't want to actually iterate the delta T. I'm iterating the values of little t and capital T, not the value delta t. And the way to do it is to, in the first spot, put sort of the form of your recursive equations, the first recursive equation in the system. You don't need the subscripts here. In effect, the nest list takes care of the subscripts, in a sense. And then put a comma, and then for, put the form of the right-hand side of the second equation here. And again, get rid of the subscripts. So we have a capital T plus F of little t, comma, capital T times delta T. I'm making delta T all one. That's one quantity, just like we need it to be one quantity when we write it by hand. The delta and the t are next to each other. Don't put a space between them. That would be bad. Don't put a star between them. Put them right next to each other. <clears throat> All right, so what does this function do? What we want to do is we want to iterate this function. Nest list is the way to do that. And the syntax looks like this. Nest list. I want to iterate this g function for a specific delta t like, let's try point one, based on a certain initial starting point, that's going to be a point, value of little t comma value of capital T, little t is starting at zero, what's capital T starting at again? The coffee? 60. And the last thing comes up to the last comma is how many iterates you want to do. How many iterations of this process. If I pick delta t to be 0.1, I'm going to need how many iterations to get close to 10.5 minutes? I need 105 iterations. Delta t is 0.1. Let's do 110 for good measure. I get a bunch of points as output. First coordinate being the value of t, the second coordinate being the value of capital T. Little t comma capital T. 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, those are the values of little t from 3. The second one's the values of capital T. 60 degrees Celsius and 59.8, etc. What is it after one minute? It's pretty close to 58. <coughs> What is it after 10.5 minutes? Pretty close to 43. It's doing a pretty good job. I could plot it with list plot. I won't take the time to do that. I can use show to combine the two plots, the, right, the actual solution with this approximation, and see visually how well it's doing. I'm not going to take the time to do that right now, though before I put this on the middle, I'll do it. I will also make the remark that when I used list plot last time, it wasn't quite in the most ideal way. Um, and I will include some other options. I just did uh, this last time. These, these are other options for getting sort of a nicer plot. The EM, by the way, is just the name I give to the list to ultimately plot it, EM being a shorthand for order method. It's not a built-in mathematical Can I clarify anything? I know I'm going kind of fast here, but you can watch the video after. You want to see something again, and I'm trying to put those timestamps in there to help you find the spots. All right, I want to spend the last 10 minutes or so here talking about the existence and uniqueness theoretical topic. I'm going to spend about one minute here right now telling you the book's main point of emphasis and let you work on the completion problems based on that point of emphasis. If you try the completion problems, 
without seeing the key, I will tell you, people usually find them confusing. But let me just say that once you get the idea, for the most part, they're actually pretty easy, especially the first few, first four, and the second four, group of four. They get harder starting with number nine. Um, the first eight are actually pretty easy, but they, people do find them confusing because they're, you sort of, they're sort of vague, and you're like, what in the world am I supposed to do? Well, once you look at the key, it should be clearer. So maybe look at the first problem's key, read my solution, and then be inspired to try the other ones without looking. Right? And the main point of emphasis that the authors make is that for your generic differential equation of this form and some initial value problem, y of 0 equals y sub 0, that if your function f there, the right-hand side function, is nice enough, and it turns out nice enough means continuous in the variable t, and what's called continuously differentiable in the variable y, which means the partial of f with respect to y, the partial derivative, exists and is continuous. On some domain, essentially containing the point, well, we can put a t0 here instead of a 0. Containing the point t0, comma y0, in some domain, containing that, some rectangle is in fact how it's phrased. The solution of this will exist and be unique over some small, possibly small interval. What does that mean? It's going to exist and can be proved to exist as a mathematical function, a well-defined mathematical function, even if you can't find a formula for it. So it's proved in an abstract sense. And if we can't find a formula for it, which we sometimes can't, knowing it exists is good because that means, well, using Euler's method, for example, to approximate it, means we're not approximating the empty set. We are approximating a function. Uniqueness has even more consequences for us, and basically it means in the slope field, um, it basically means solution curves can't touch each other. Distinct solution curves can't touch each other. They can't cross, they can't even touch for one point if they are truly distinct solution curves, is the main thing the book emphasizes. I want to emphasize some other things, and again, this is related to this extra reading assignment that I'm going to be giving you. A number of reading assignments. In this section of today's notebook, I've got two theorems and a couple examples. Probably we're going to only have time for the theorems, and maybe even only the first theorem here. Theorems. A theorem in math is a, a mathematical statement of fact, and usually an important fact. Less important facts are often called lemmas, for example, is another word used. You also hear proposition and corollary. Maybe proposition is a little lower than the theorem. They're, they're essentially synonyms. Corollaries can be important, though they're called corollaries because they follow easily from some other big important fact. And they're usually a little bit more specific, whereas theorems are usually a little bit more general. Let f of t be a continuous function of t for all real values of t. Now, I could make this extra nitpicky and say, well, over some interval. But to keep things as simple as possible, I'm going to assume these things are continuous for all values of t in this case, over the entire real number y. So you can make the slope field over the entire ty plane, theoretically. There's four conclusions here. First of all, the solution of any initial value problem here, where t0 and y0 are arbitrary, exists for all t. There is some function that solves this, even if you can't find a formula for it in any ordinary kind of way, even if you have to approximate it. It exists in a well-defined technical mathematical sense. Second statement, if capital F of t is a solution, and c is any constant, then capital F of t plus c is also a solution. The vertical translations of solutions are still solutions, which makes sense for pure antiderivatives. You already knew that from calculus 1, even. That's the plus c for your indefinite integral. You can vertically translate an antiderivative of a function, little f, and get another antiderivative. 
Part C sounds like it says something that's the same, but it's actually different. If f and g are both solutions, then they differ by a constant. They are vertical translations of each other. B and C are two different statements here. B says, if you've got a solution and you vertically translate it, you'll get another solution. C says, if you've got two solutions, they must be vertical translations of each other. Slightly different kinds of statements of truth. Finally, part D, the solution of any initial value problem, like this one, f is continuous. And it is good enough for this to be continuous and not necessarily differentiable, is unique. Okay. Let me show you an example, first of all, that shows that this is not about nothing, okay? Um, if, for example, the little f of t is sine of t squared, for example, what's the general solution of the differential equation, first of all? This is a pure antiderivative problem. You can find it just by integrating integrating, in this case, sine of t squared. Though I guarantee you, if you sat in your uh, dorm tonight, or wherever you live, and tried to integrate sine of t squared, I guarantee you'd, you'd be all up all night and you'd never come up with an answer. In fact, you could work your entire life and never come up with an answer. With a caveat, if you only allow yourselves to use what are called closed form expressions involving elementary functions, which are no infinite sums are allowed, okay? That's out the window. Um, closed form means essentially a finite sum or product, etc. Of elementary functions, what are elementary functions? Functions you're used to, sine, well, trig functions, inverse trig, exponential, logarithms, polynomials, etc., and combinations of those, adding, multiplying, subtracting, dividing, and also function composition plugging one function into another, like sine of t squared, for example, you'd never come up with an answer. In fact, it can even be proven, although I don't know how to prove it. What will Mathematica do with this? Will it just give up? No, actually, it doesn't give up. It, it spits back an answer, but it's an answer you never would have guessed. Square root of pi over 2 times Fresnel s of square root of 2 over pi times t. Fresnel s, huh? OK, that's a non-elementary function. You've never heard of it before unless maybe I said it in Calc 2 and you took Calc 2 for me. But it does work. This will be the last thing we do here today. But let's make the slope field and plot this in the slope field. following the slope field and that sort of hints of it. I'll make, before I put it on the Moodle, I'll make the slope field nicer. Okay. It is a solution. See you on Friday.